this will be the concluding lecture uh, to Wise Blood, Flannery O'Connor's Wise Blood, and to the course. Um, the novel here, um, how does one put it, uh, reaches its final climaxes. Um, the the sense of of uh, violence subdued violence and anger that we find in Enoch and in Hazel Motes um, finally bursts forth in the explosion of of murderous acts um, which in some ways I think surprises many people when all this happens and and that the, the way that the descriptions of the of the of the the killings in some ways are so matter of fact and part of the strangeness of O'Connor's sort of very straightforward almost factual representation of activities and actions human actions and feelings and emotions uh, is kind of shocking uh, and and mysterious um, the title of that book mystery and manners of all of her essays um, the way in which from from the inner source of emptiness and anger that's been suppressed or, or unacknowledged finds its way out in these expressions of extreme violence and hatred. Um, so what do we have here? We have we have um, um, we have a um, the stealing of the mummy by Enoch, uh, the the meeting of the of Gonga the gorilla, um, the the um, the killing of the actor by Enoch, and the putting on of the gorilla suit, and then Hazel killing the false preacher Solus Layfield, and the, the patrolman. Pushing the evidence of the murder, unbeknownst to him, push, it's kind of funny. Pushing, push, the, pushing the car over the edge. The interesting fact is that you know the patrolman comes and you think that Hazel is going to get arrested, but in fact, arbitrarily just pushes the car over the edge. Hazel's whole existence is shattered, and he winds up blinding himself, and then. Uh, undergoing these horrible forms of self-mutilation and winds up being beaten to death by a police officer. That's the end. This is the violent ending of it. Um, and again, the, the, the way in which the mystery, the mysterious way in which um, these, this internal tension winds up expressing itself in this violence um, is what's so remarkable I think in this novel and and create such a sense of discomfort um, and disturbance uh, which is the point that she was trying to make um, so um, chapter 10 uh, begins a very very it's it's one of those chapters that just you, you are immersed right into the middle of it um, and remember, it's right after he sees that, um, it's right after he sees that, um, um, Asa Hawks is a fake. So I'm going to read it, read the way the chapter begins. The next night, Hayes parked the Essex in front of the Od Odeon Theater and climbed up on it and began to preach. Let me tell you what I and this church stand for, he called from the nose of the car. He looks just like his grandfather, right? In the perch of the car, yelling at people, stop one minute to listen to the truth because you may never hear it again. He stood there with his neck thrust forward, moving one arm upward in a vague arc. Remember, the power is in the neck and arms of the preacher. Two women and a boy stopped. I preach there are all kinds of truth, your truth and somebody else's truth, but behind all of them, there's only one truth, 
and that is that there's no truth, he called. No truth beyond all truth is what I and this church preach. When you, where you come from is gone, where you thought you were going to was there, to, to never was there, and where you are is no good unless you can get away from it. Where is there a place for you to be? No place. Notice the, the, the way he's trying to eradicate every sense of, of oneself, one's past, um, one's future, one's present. Of course, he, the, the, the problem is he can't escape his past. He never will at all. It just to try to escape the past is to relive it constantly in, in forms of, of, of explosions, right? Uh, of, Freud was right about this, right? The, the, the way, the compulsion to repeat past traumas that are never, that are never fully worked through. They are always there. Hayes is just spouting a complete psychological falsehood. Nothing outside you can give you any place. He should realize that, right? <laughs> look inside. You need to look at the sky because it's not going to open up and show you no place behind it. You need to search for any hole in the ground to look through into somewhere else. You can't go neither forwards nor backwards into your daddy's time nor your children's if you have them. Right? You'd like to go back into your parents' past and change it. Maybe, maybe you can fix it. Um, if you've never seen the film Back to the Future, you should. I just watched it with my children. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant uh, movie about therapy. The, 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 the son goes back in time, is able to help the father and help betters his own life. It's, it's a brilliant film, all about trauma. If there was any fall, look there. If there was any redemption, look there. And if you expect any judgment, look there, because they all three will have to be in your time and your body, and where in your time and your body can they be? This is brilliant. Where in your time and your body has Jesus redeemed you? Show me where, because I don't see the place. If there was a place where Jesus had redeemed you, that would be the place for you to be, but which of you can find it? Right. So um, there is something true about this, right? That, And this is the, the difficult question for Christianity to an answer. You know, if, if there has been this redemption, why is it so, so unclear? Um, why does it take, why doesn't it immediately change people? Um, you know, existentially, in the lived existence, one still must struggle. Um, where, where is the contours? Where are the contours of redemption? Um, where is the conversion? Uh, so this is always a difficult question for the Christian to answer. And Hayes is, is centered on, on, the, on the central problem of, of human existence and human suffering. Right? What, what, what's to be done about it? Um, how can we solve it? How can we avoid it. And he's right. You can't find it anywhere else but in yourself. And and so don't look outside of yourself. Hayes has been looking, and I think integrity here, it has been looking inside um, and can't find the solution. So he's going to reject Christianity because of that. Um, so, um, you know, there's a, it, it, it's an attempt to eradicate conscience. Um, but, but this is a contradictory action. Um, his, his, his actions deny it. Um, you know, uh, your conscience is a trick. He says it didn't, it don't exist though. You may think it does. And if you think it does, you had best get it out in the open and hunt it down and kill it because it's no more than your face in the mirror is, or your shadow behind you. That is a very straightforward kind of hokey um, brilliant uh, articulation of Freud's own theory of the super the super ego is simply a projection of one's own morality as though it were real um, once one realizes that that your moral your guilt your shame 
is merely a projection that you've created, you've imbibed from others that have projected onto the world, then you're free. You're free of all moral constraints. Um, this is a brilliant, dramatic depiction of Freudian, of Freudian psychoanalysis. Um, and and O'Connor has 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 really sort of you know dramatized this, um, and she's going to dramatize the way, it, at least for her, the way it fails. Um, so, the arrival of Hoover Schultz, Oni J. Holy, right, in a new with a with a moats lookalike, right, uh, teaches this self redemption in the Holy Church of Christ. Um, and Hazel hates this because um, he realizes that you can't, if, if things are whacked out, if things are broken, you're the broken one, you can't fix yourself. So there's no self-redemption. Hazel's not going there either. Um, you have to deny completely that there's anything wrong. So you see how far down, how deep down Hazel has gone in trying to eradicate Christ into the self, into the conscience, get rid of conscience, and there's no more need for Christ and Christ's redemption and Christ's judgment. Um, so Hazel returns to his room, finds Sabbath in his bed. She's been abandoned by her father. Um, and she she begins to despise. She, if she hasn't despised him now, she's she's she really does. Um, and, and this is a sad, sad scene. Um, he comes in. Hayes leaned down and began untying his shoes. They were old army shoes that he had painted black to get the government off. It's brilliant. Right? It's a, just one little line there shows how much he hated the army and the government, what it did to him. He untied them and eased his feet out and sat there looking down while he watched him cautiously. Are you going to hit me or not? She asked. If you are, go ahead and do it right now because I'm not going. I ain't got any place to go. This is a horrible situation where, you know, she'll even tolerate abuse, physical abuse, because there's nowhere to go. This is a typical form of dysfunction. He didn't look as if he were going to hit anything. He looked as if he were going to sit there until he died. Listen, she said with a quick change of tone. From the middle I set eyes on you, I said to myself, that's what I got to have. Just give me some of him. I said, look at those pecan eyes and go crazy, girl. That innocent look don't hide a thing. He's just pure filthy right down to the guts like me. The only difference is I like being that way and he don't. Yes, sir, I like being that way and I can teach you how to like it. Don't you want to learn how to like it? Um, so um, she's a... Sabbath is a deep danger to Hazel, right? Um, you know, um, this will be the, 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 one, of the, one of the forms of integrity, according to Flannery O'Connor in that essay, The Nature and Aim of Fiction, is that he can't, he can't escape the thing he's trying to escape. He can't do the thing he's trying to do, which is eradicate conscience. Um, he still feels bad. He still recognizes something wrong feels the pain. Sabbath has inoculated herself to the pain. Um, so, again, this the way in which people turn to sexual relationships to, 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 to hide suffering and pain is a typical dysfunction, um, psychological dysfunction. It uh, needs therapy, really, to, to overcome. Um, so chapter 11 begins with Enoch this crazy scene where Enoch steals the mummy from the museum. And um, I love, by the way, the museum is always spelled museum with the, with the, with the, the Roman letter U as a V, right? Um, it's, he must see that spelled there and just can't decipher it. And it says museum. It's like a, it shows how it, touch with what a museum even is you know he goes in to see the mummy because he's fascinated by this weirdness of it um so uh he steals the mummy and 
Um, and um, he's caught in a storm here and enters the theater with Ganga the gorilla here. Um, you know, um, you know this life-size picture of Ganga the gorilla. Um, so um, a Ganga will appear at 12 a.m. today. A free pass to the first ten brave enough to step up and shake his hand, right? Um, so we get we get we don't get the exact contours of Enoch's internal thinking process, but we get Flannery and Connor sort of pointing to it. Uh, this is funny and horrible at the same time. It's on page 178. Enoch usually was usually thinking of something else at the moment that fate began drawing back her leg to kick him. Fate with a capital F, right? We've got, again, Oedipus and all the problems of fate flooding in here. Um, given Enoch's lack of rational appropriation of his own instincts, of course this is fated. Um, he can't control it, so it might as well be fate. When he was four years old, here's the here's the ex, here's the explanation. One scene. She doesn't paint it. She doesn't talk about the dysfunction and the trauma and the neglect and the physical abuse, right? Enoch heard from it. physical abuse. No, he gives. She gives one scene that paints a picture. When he was four years old, his father had brought him home a tin box from the penitentiary. Penitentiaries. Father was in the state penitentiary. He's a violent criminal. It's all we need to know about Enoch's upbringing. Think how brilliant and how quick, how concise O'Connor gives us these details. This is great writing. It was orange and had a picture of some peanut brittle on the outside of it and green letters that said, a nutty surprise. When Enoch had opened it, a coiled piece of steel had sprung out at him and broken off the ends of his two front teeth. This is four years old. This is his father. That's a gift for him. His life this is horrifying, right? This is a horrifying, this is the fun part of his life. Imagine what happened when he wasn't trying to give him a gift, right? His life was full of so many happenings like that that it would seem he should have been more sensitive to his times of danger. He should have been. How can he? Right? There's no there's no perch for reflection. There's no there's no moment of equipoise where Enoch could possibly have come to grips with himself and had a moment to reflect on himself. He stood there and read the poster twice through carefully. To his mind, an opportunity to insult a successful ape came from the hand of providence. He suddenly regained all his reverence for the new Jesus. He saw that he was going to be re rewarded after all and have the supreme moment he had expected. All right, so he's going to come back um, and, and insult Ganga the gorilla. Um, again, to prove his, super his superiority over the beasts. Uh, it's... <laughs> It's brilliant. Um, so um, the the um, the um, the scene in which he goes back, um, the kids are a little frightened. Enoch is 18 years old. You know, he's not really a child, but he, he might as well be one. He's so stunted in his in his upbringing and his maturity. Um, so, um, Enoch gets in line, um, this is at page 181, um, he's afraid, he's afraid of this guy in a gorilla suit, right? Um, why? Because he fears sort of contact with human beings. He's awkward. He's 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 um, he's always at a disadvantage. Um, 
social situations are, are fearful, right, for him. Uh, so he finally overcomes his fear and was trying frantically, it says, to think of an obscene remark that would be suitable to insult him with. Usually he didn't have any trouble with this kind of composition, but nothing came to him now. His brain, both parts, was completely empty. He couldn't think even of the insulting phrases he used every day. There were only two children in front of him by now. The first one shook hands and stepped aside. Enoch's heart was beating violently. The child in front of him finished and stepped aside and left him facing the ape, who took his hand with an automatic motion. He comes to the scene of, 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 of poignant drama, sad, a sad moment. Um, it was the first hand that had been extended to Enoch since he had come to the city. Lonely, coming to the city, isolated, seeking affirmation. It was warm and soft. He feels tenderness. For a second, he only stood there clasping it. Then he began to stammer. My name is Enoch Emery. I attended the Road Mill Boys Bible Academy. I work at the city zoo. He's telling him about himself, his life story. I've seen two pictures of yours. I'm only 18 year old, but I already work for the city. My daddy made me come and his voice cracked. This is brilliant. This is a moment of, of transparency and, and a moment of, of, of Enoch exposing himself, showing himself, uh, a moment of fragility, right? A moment of self-disclosure, of self-revelation. What does he get? Possibly a moment of grace, right? Possibly a moment of redemption. A moment where he could be affirmed. He's seeking to, his life to be affirmed. See how brilliant this is? A star leaned slightly forward and a change came in his eyes. An ugly pair of human ones moved closer and squinted at Enoch from behind the celluloid pair. You go to hell. A surly voice inside the ape suit said low but distinctly, and the hand was jerked away. Enoch's humiliation was so sharp and painful that he turned around three times before he realized which direction he wanted to go in. Then he ran off into the rain as fast as he could. You can imagine how horribly funny this scene might be, this pathetic, you know, and, and, and stupid, right? But, but this is the loss of a, of a human being right here. This is, this is Flannery O'Connor's brilliance. These little moments that are seemingly innocuous, that, 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 that produce the arc of a life, the contours of a life. Um, so, um, you know, Enoch, Enoch will have his vengeance. Um, so the mummy then, he brings the mummy to Sabbath and Hazel. You can imagine the state he's in. Uh, they call it the new Jesus, which has a tremendously strange effect, right? Um, this Jesus is bloodless, um, um, lifeless. Um, it's, he's dead, and he's going to stay dead. That's the new Jesus. Um and um, so um, <sighs> Sabbath is fascinated by it. Um, and, and I think her line of vision here is the, is the appropriate one to recognize it. Um, you know, um, she begins, she says it, there was, or she's thinking, on page 185, there was something in him of everyone she had ever known, as if they had all been rolled into one person and killed and shrunk and died. It's death. It's the great life. And somehow Sabbath intuits this and sees it, sees everybody that she knows shriveled and dead and contained in this. Um, 
she has the right response. Although it's completely crazy, right? Because the thing is dead. She begins to care for it like a doll, like a baby. Um, and the tenderness that she shows this shows the depth of her desire to love and her desire to, to be loved. And the vulnerability here, it's what, it's what Enoch will not be able to face. His vulnerable nature is because he's been smacked around so much. Um, but she begins to care for it. Um, she, she sees it as a symbol of, of, of everybody's vulnerability. Um, and Hazel can't stand it and just takes this mummy and just smashes it. It's a crazy scene and totally insane scene, right? This mummy taken from a museum. Um, so he destroys the new Jesus because, because no, you know, this is too much. In, this is too much tenderness. This is, you got to get rid of even that. He realizes it's too much like, it's too much like the kind of comfort that a, a real Jesus, the, 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 the real representation of Jesus that we find in the Gospels, really caring and compassionate um, for the for the outcast and the poor and the and the the sinful, those who are, who are even threatened threatened by death, right? he comes to their rescue. Um, so um, her assessment of him. Um, is that, is that he's just mean and violent um, and um, because he he doesn't want anything but Jesus I knew she says when I first seen you you were mean and evil a furious voice behind him said I seen you wouldn't let nobody have nothing I seen you were mean enough to slain, slam a baby against a wall I seen you wouldn't never have no fun or let anybody else because you didn't want nothing but Jesus. So the, the corruption of this sense of Jesus as a judgmental figure of a redemption as, as, re, as requiring this extreme judgment where judgment crowds out redemption and, and kindness. Um, that's a very corrupt form of Christianity there. And she's just described it. You know, people want to eradicate any fun that anybody could possibly have because it's all they want is Jesus. He turned to raise his arm in a vicious gesture, almost losing his balance in the door. Drops of rainwater were splattered over the front of the glasses and on his red face. And here and there, they hung sparkling from the brim of his hat. I don't want nothing but the truth, he shouted. And what you see is the truth, and I've seen it. Preacher talk. Where were you going to run off to? I've seen the only truth there is, he shouted. Where were you going to run off to? Some other city to preach the truth. The church without Christ. And I got a car to get there in. I got, but he was stopped by a cough. It was not much of a cough. It sounded like a little yell for help at the bottom of a canyon. But the color and the expression drained out of his face until it was as straight and blank as the rain falling down behind him. So the sense of the car, it's going to take him to another city, right? Just a change of scenery, right? There's the image of the car. And that's why it's so powerful that it gets destroyed. Um, so oh, Enoch believes in the new Jesus. He thinks it's going to do something for him. Um, so um, it says in the very next chapter, in spite of himself, Enoch couldn't get over the expectation that the new Jesus was going to do something for him in return for his services. This was the virtue of hope, which was made up in Enoch of two parts suspicion and one part lust. Can't help but laugh at that. You know, his hope, two parts suspicion and one part lust. Um, this, is, this is a deeply debilitated person. T distrustful but but lustful, desirous of just sexual um, sexual um, uh, pleasure. Um, he's driven by vanity, ambition, a need for power, and lust. 
these are the two desires that Freud claims inhabit every human person. And everybody's a neurotic. Everybody wants power over the world and everybody wants sexual satisfaction. Um, so Enoch is, an, is a perfect representation of, of, and, of Freud's idea. Enoch and, and Hazel both can combine, combine to represent the Freudian, the Freudian view of human nature. Um, so he goes and, and, and kills the man playing the gong other gorilla. It's driven by envy. The, gong, the guy who plays Ganga, his ability to, to have power over people, to harm people, right? Um, you know, jealousy, hatred, mostly revenge. All of the ways in which Enoch has been harmed and has been has suffered abuse from people is channeled into this one act of rage. Um, and he's going to avenge himself on Ganga, the gorilla. Um, it's brilliant and weird that he goes off and puts the gorilla, the gorilla suit on. Um, and um, I'll read the description. Then it began to growl and beat its chest, it jumped up and down and flung its arms and thrust its head forward. The growls were thin and uncertain at first, but they grew louder after a second. They became low and poisonous, louder again, low and poisonous again. They stopped altogether. The figure extended its hand, clutched nothing, shook its arm vigorously. There's the action of trying to shake hands. It withdrew the arm, extended again, clutched nothing, and shook. It repeated this four or five times, the compulsion to repeat that moment of trauma. He's in the gorilla suit. He's going to shake the hands with the absent Enoch, right? And, and make up for it, and affirm his existence. Then it picked up the pointed stick and placed it at a cocky angle on its arms and left the woods for the highway. He's avenged himself. No gorilla in existence, whether in the jungles of Africa or California or in New York City, in the finest department in the world, was happier at that, at that moment than this one, whose God had finally rewarded it. Um, the the last scene is 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 Ganga, right? A gorilla stuck, but as though sur surprised and pre presently its arm fell to its side. It sat down on the rock where they had been sitting and stared over the valley at the uneven skyline of the city. What is Enoch going to become? Um, probably a mass murderer. Um, Certainly, certainly headed for the penitentiary at some point. Um, this very quickly leads into Hayes killing the false preacher Solus Layfield. He runs him over with his rat-colored automobile. Uh, looking over his dead body, um, you know, um, by the way, he has him take off the suit that that is that the suit is made to look like Hazel. It makes him take off the suit. He, he he's 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 running out of his pants. It's humiliating, right? His, his underwear. Um, I'll read the passage because it's so funny and horrible at the same time. The prophet began to run in earnest. He tore off his shirt and unbuckled his belt and ran out of his trousers. He began grabbing for his feet as if he would take off his shoes too. But before he could get at them, the Essex knocked him flat and ran over him. Hayes drove about 20 feet and stopped the car and then began to back it. He backed it over the body and then stopped and got out. The Essex stood half over the preacher, prophet. The idea that he, 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 she continues to name him the prophet is brilliant. As if it were pleased to guard what it finally brought down. The man didn't look so much like Hayes lying on the ground on his face without his hat or suit on. A lot of blood was coming out of him and forming a puddle around his head. He was motionless, all but for one finger that moved up and down in front of his face, as if it were a time with it. Hayes poked his toe in his side, and he wheezed for a second and then was quiet. Two things I can't stand, Hayes said. A man 
that ain't true and one that mocks what is. You shouldn't you shouldn't have ever have tampered with me if you didn't want what you got. So the, the, this, this integrity of Hayes is quite weird and strange. Um, this craving for honesty, uh, when it when it is in a dysfunctional human being like Hazel, produces um, deep forms of of dysfunction um, and yeah. Uh, Dysfunction, I, was, I stopped, I paused there because my children came running in and I didn't want you to hear them. Dysfunction is one word. This is more than dysfunction. This is, this is a pathology, right? Psycho, psychopathology. Um, what is O'Connor arguing here in the dramatization of Enoch and Hayes? That the psych psychopaths... Uh, uh, the, 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 the inclination to murder comes from a lack of love. Um, this is not psychobabble, but the place in which Flannery O'Connor's Catholic vision of God as a, a God of love and that Christianity as a religion of love makes with her sense of, of, of trauma and the way in which um, trauma is passed on through the generations. It's her dramatization of the way humans suffer, inflict suffering on others and, and come to share that suffering in, 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 the, in common humanity. It's a, it's, a, it's a very, her view here, although it's brutally presented, uh, her view here is very sympathetic and compassionate that, that, that our, our sense of suffering should be shared um, and is, in fact. Um, so, this horrible, this horrible idea of honesty and the search for the truth that becomes deeply disformed and and dysfunctional and 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 pathological. Um, one can see this um, in in a lot of religious institutions, uh, a lot of institutions in general, right? Because it's anything that's treat, created with, treated with such seriousness um, that has a a deep dysfunction at the basis of it will work its way out in brutal ways, especially if it becomes bureaucratic and has power as an institution. Um, this is just one man, um, but that's where it begins with one human being. Um, so Hazel's new position is that truth is only of the senses, and you can find salvation in blasphemy because that's at least believing in something. So he realized he has to believe in something, he's going to believe in blasphemy. And just believe in the things of the senses. Um, he continues to curse Jesus. So if you're in that position and a patrolman comes over and, you know, again, you're thinking he's going to get arrested. A patrolman just comes over and sees this horrible car, pushes the Essex over, over a cliff, right, over a hill. Um, is brutally humorous. I'll read it. Page 211. The patrolman got behind the Essex and pushed over the embankment, and the cow stumbled up and galloped across the field and into the woods. That's funny. Sorry. The buzzard flapped off to a tree at the edge of the clearing. The car landed on its top with the three wheels that stayed on spinning. The motor bounced out and rolled some distance away, and various odd pieces scattered this way and that. Sorry, brilliant. You can see this just getting red knots, you know, just bouncing and bouncing and just watching this unfold. It's it's a it's it's Hazel's life symbolized there, his his attempt to escape himself. Smashed in a funny, horrible way. Them that don't have a car don't need a license. The patrolman said, dusting his hands on his pants. Right. So, oh, you don't have a license? You don't need a car. I mean, this is, this is, by the way, you know, typical um, police activity in the 50s. Has it changed much? I guess not. I guess we see 
obviously in what's happening in the news, we see we see police taking matters in their own hands all the time. Um, Hayes stood there, but it's it's it that, but it's it's the contours of what's happening here, right? He was he was ready to leave. He was going off to another city. He was going to become a new person, right? There he there's his means smashed. Hayes stood for a few minutes, looking over at the scene. His face seemed to reflect the entire distance across the clearing and on beyond, the entire distance that expended from his eyes to the blank gray sky that went on depth after depth into space. Again, he's confronting the nothingness that he's become, the emptiness inside. His knees bent under him and he sat down in the edge of the bank with his feet hanging over him. Police starts being polite. Are you going somewhere? Can I get you? Can I take you somewhere? No, Hayes said. You hadn't, hadn't planned to go anywhere? Hayes shook his head. His face didn't change, and he didn't turn it toward the patrolman. It seemed to be concentrated on space. You know, the patrolman is polite now and leaves. Um, he walks back to the city three hours. Just amazing. He stopped at a supply store and bought a tin bucket and a sack of quick lime, and then he went on to where he lived carrying these. When he reached the house, he stopped outside on the sidewalk and opened the sack of lime and poured the buckets half full of it. Then he went to a water spigot by the front steps and filled up the rest of the bucket with water and started up the steps. His landlady was sitting on the porch rocking a cat. He's moved by now. He's moved into a different house with this woman named Mrs. Flood. What you going to do with that, Mr. Motes? She asked. This is the first time Mr. Motes, right? That idea of the moat in the eye. Blind myself, he said, and went on in the house. The landlady sat there for a while longer. She was not a woman who felt more violence in one word than in another. She took every word at its face value, but all the faces were the same. Still, instead of blinding herself, if she had felt that bad, she would have killed herself. She wondered why anybody wouldn't do that. She would simply have put her head in an oven or maybe have given herself too many painless sleeping pills, and that would have been that. Perhaps Mr. Motes was only being ugly, but what possible reason could a person have for wanting to destroy their sight? A woman like her, who was so clear-sighted, could never stand to be blind. If she had to be blind, she would rather be dead. It occurred to her suddenly that when she was dead, she would be blind too. She stared in front of her intensely, facing this for the first time. Keep that image in mind of being dead and blind, but she's going to be staring into Hazel Motes' dead, dead eyes, dead body. She stared in front of her intensely, facing this for the first time. She recalled the phrase eternal death that preachers use, but she cleared it out of her mind immediately with no more change expression than a cat. She was not religious or morbid, for which every day she thanked her stars. She would credit a person who had that streak with anything, though, and Mr. Motes had it, or he wouldn't be a preacher. He might put lime in his eyes, and she wouldn't doubt it a bit, because they were all, if the truth was only known, a little bit off in their heads. What possible reason could a sane person have for wanting to not enjoy himself anymore? Certainly she couldn't say. So that's the run-of-the-mill normal way of thinking about things. Um, you know, just um, being comfortable. Put it, all this stuff out of, the, out, of her mind, out of your mind. Hazel, to his credit, has the integrity, can't do it. Um, so this leads us to the final chapter. Um, she wants to possess things. She wants comfort. Uh, Hayes represents a desire for something she understand. Um, even with his blindness, it looks like he's looking at something. The blind man had the look of seeing something to Mrs. Flood. Um, so the landlady thinks of him as a monk, right? Um, and um, he says he doesn't doesn't have time to preach anymore. Um, and 
it turns out that he's got glass in his shoes. Uh, he's wearing barbed wire around his chest. Um, and um, and he's a, she asked him why, why he's doing this. Um, and she says, he says at page 226, um, to pay, simply to pay. He calls the barbed wire around his chest. Uh, why does he do it? I'm not clean. Uh, so this, she thinks of him as a monk, a throwback to the 13th century, um, some medieval form of chastisement um, that um, that um, he's performing, and of course, in some sense, it is. Um, Let's see a passage. Um, there's a funny passage where, um, where where she points this out. People don't do it. And um, um, he says, um, he says, well, I do. Um, so too bad. Um, you know, um, so, oh, yeah, people have quit. What do you do it for? I'm sorry, I'll read the whole passage. Well, it's not normal. It's like one of them gory stories. It's something that people have quit doing, like boiling in oil or being a saint or walling up cats. There's no reason for it. People have quit doing it. They ain't quit doing it as long as I'm doing it. It's brutally funny. People have quit doing it. What do you do it for? I'm not clean. I know it. you got blood in that nightshirt and on the bed, right? That's not the kind of clean he means. Uh, there's only one kind of clean, Mr. Motes, clean, cleanliness of the body, right? And he's, he's not clean inside. His spirit is corrupt. Um, and, um, and this is what he's, he's, he instinctually recognizes that he has to undergo this, this brutal form of self-torture um, as a form of, as a form of, um, of penance. Um, so Mrs. Flood, being the practical person that she is, starts to realize that, that, you know, he is kind of crazy, but he needs somebody to take care of him. And she'd like his paychecks that are coming from the government. Um, and um, she kind of proposes to him. And um, she, he rebuffs her, of course. He's got no interest in this. And, um, and in, in a fit of anger, um, she throws him out. She throws him out in an ice storm. Uh, again, the, the sense of dysfunction here. Um, 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 uh, What, what starts off as a need that when not met becomes an act of violence and pain for another person. Um, so um, um, so the the Yeah, she begins to to um to think about this, to fantasize about this, um, about this activity, right? And she begins to regret what she's done. She's realized that she's she's thrown him out, um, and he's he's vulnerable, um, and um. Here's the description of her. She, she, she begins to break down, right? The, 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 the Hazel Motes coming into her life has been, a, uh, in some ways, a moment of, of returning to herself. That night, a driving icy rain came up, and lying in her bed awake at night, Mrs. Flood, the landlady, began to weep. 
She wanted to run out in the rain and cold and hunt him and find him huddled in some half-sheltered place and bring him back and say, Mr. Motes, Mr. Motes, you can stay here forever. Or the two of us will go where you're going. The two of us will go. She had had a hard life without pain and without pleasure. And she thought that now that she was coming to the last part of it, she deserved a friend. The hard life with pain and without pleasure. You know, pain does not necessarily, and suffering does not necessarily preclude happiness. We want to get rid of pain as much as we can, but that's 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 generally not the way things work. Um, so th this moment of Hazel coming into her life has sort of opened her to vulnerability. If she was going to be blind when she was dead, who better to guide her than a blind man? Who better to lead the blind than the blind who knew what it was like? Um, so she tries to look for him. Um, and, and two days later, um, you know, that policeman find him laying, laying in the, he's homeless. Um, the police, when he doesn't get up, crack him in the head with their nightsticks. Um, and, um, you know, um, they, they, um, They bring him back because they realize that he has not paid his rent. And Mrs. Flood is looking for the rent, right? Um, so um, the irony of this is that her own actions have led to, pretty much led to his death, right? Um, so I'll just read the last section of this, which is, you know, painful, tremendously. There's nothing funny about this about this, the tragedy that's unfolded. Um, he died in the squad car, but they didn't notice and took him onto the landladies. She had them put him on her bed, and when she had pushed, the, pushed them out the door, she locked it behind them and drew up a straight chair and sat down where she could talk to him. The kindness here. Well, Mr. Motes, she said, I see you've come home. His face was stern and tranquil. I knew you'd come back, and I've been waiting for you, and you needn't to pay any more rent, but have it free here any way you like, upstairs or down, just however you want it, and with me to wait on you, or if you want to go on somewhere, we'll both go. She had never observed his face more composed, and she grabbed his hand and held it to her heart. It was res resistless and dry. The outline of a skull was plain under his skin, and the deep burned eye sockets seemed to lead into the dark tunnel where he had disappeared. This is the moment of emptiness and the moment of revelation and disclosure. Again, the third moment where somebody is looking into somebody else's eyes. She leaned closer and closer to his face, looking deep into them, trying to see how she had been cheated or what had cheated her. She's been, it's her own loss she's worried about, but she couldn't see anything. She shut her eyes and saw the pinpoint of light, but so far away that she could not hold it, steady in her mind. She felt as if she were blocked at the entrance of something. She sat staring with her eyes shut into his eyes and felt as if she had finally got to the beginning of something she couldn't begin. And she saw him moving farther and farther away, farther and farther into the darkness until he was the pinpoint of light. So, um, what to say about this um, this moment, right? The the final moment in which in which we have a almost a po the first positive movement in the whole novel of some insight, right? She sees a this she's a she's looking into his eyes and and in the emptiness there in the blindness she recognizes something beyond a pinpoint of light. Um, it's obviously her his whether imagined or not, right, uh, some representation of his soul, of what he is, this pinpoint of light entering the darkness, right? And, and she's, through her, through her sense of concern for him, through sympathy for him, 
she begins to feel for him and sees him slipping away. Um, and, and the retreat into death, the coming face to face with a dead man who she's cared for opens her up. Um, but again, it's the beginning of something she can't fathom. Um, this mystery, um, beginning of something she couldn't begin. She saw him moving farther and farther away, farther and farther into the darkness until he was the pinpoint of light. Right. This, this one moment of, of, of light and um, positivity. That's all we get. Jen and Flannery Connor. We get nothing more than this um, in her writings. Um, she talked. Hang on a second. So yeah, the the mystery, right, um, is what O'Connor has has brought the drama of the novel to. Um, it. It doesn't say that there's, it doesn't affirm anything positive there. It affirms the need for something like redemption uh, to make sense of a brutal world, um, a world in which we all participate in the violence of, 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 um, of negation, right? So the moment of negation led to that point of emptiness is the point at which something positive might begin. Uh, the, the moment of need and recognition um, leads to the moment of, of seeking something beyond what's, what, what we find in the appearance of things. Um, I'll leave with a comment. This is the first thing she wrote, and she started writing short stories, as I pointed out. Um, she was, she was um, aware of the limitations of her, of her writing um, at the end of her life. And, and in a letter that I've read, um, to a friend of hers, she said, I realize that I just do the grotesque and the violent um, and the beautiful, um, which is usually the subject matter of art. Um, she says, I, I've never really done that. Um, and um, it's not that she was incapable of doing it. Um, it's that her preoccupation was with was with showing to a world that didn't accept either the principle, either the idea of sin or redemption, right? Morality or its possibility of being reclaimed, right? Um, so she she wrote in these distorted ways to sort of convince, try to convince people the need for redemption. That's the, so. So she thought she she thought at this point, right after she wrote one of her greatest short stories um, called Revelation. Um, uh, she thought she should try to do something different, a more positive representation of human nature. Uh, she became really really sick with lupus and no longer could write, and then died. So a kind of interesting way of thinking about this. She doesn't. This isn't a, a, an obsession with her for the sake of being brutal or because she's pathological or because she has a fascination with with the ugly and the evil, um, but um, that she she um, she felt a certain need in the culture to write this way, and um, it would have been it would have been I I'd, I'd give a lot to know what kinds of stories she would have written that would have been tender and beautiful and, and filled with something positive. Uh, but we've never, we're left just wondering. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that thought um, and uh, conclude the, the course of lectures with, with that idea. Uh, 